I'd like to thank everyone for being here today. Thank you so much for joining the American Rose Society's webinars. Uh, we have a very special webinar today with the partnering with Heritage Rose Foundation. So we're very excited about that. And so we will um, have some uh, exciting information that you will learn about. And we always want you to be uh, checking out our webinars. So always check that email box in. We plan to have quite a few webinars over the next couple months. Gary? All right. Uh, in partnership with the American Rose Society, the Heritage Rose Foundation has designed and curated the fourth circle of the Great Garden Restoration at the American Rose Center in Shreveport, Louisiana, featuring pre-1900 Heritage Roses. Heritage Rose Foundation President Stephen Scandiello, Connie Helker, will talk about the designing, selecting, and growing roses for the fourth circle. Fourth circle. Anita Clevenger, former curator of the Sacramento Historic Rose Garden and a vice president of the Heritage Rose Foundation, will now moderate the Heritage Rose Foundation webinar and the Q&A session. Good morning, okay, or good afternoon for most of you. I'm out here in Sacramento, so it's still morning for us. Thank you for joining us. We have a lot of moving parts in this presentation today in this webinar. We will be talking about the fourth circle roses, but also about preserving heritage roses in general. And Connie will be describing um, the classes of the old roses and give some examples of what's growing in the fourth circle, as well as a few other favorites. What we'll be doing first of all is Stephen will have a few remarks and then turn it over to Connie for her discussion about heritage rose classes. Then back to Stephen to talk more about preservation of roses in the Heritage Rose Foundation. We'll have you can ask questions in writing during this. If there's anything we really uh, need to answer during for clarification during the presentations. We'll do so. Otherwise, at the end, uh, when of Stephen's presentation, I'll as moderator read the questions, and all of us will answer. Peggy Martin's on the line also, and we'll be talking a little bit about her favorites, the bourbon roses, and how to train them for both best advantage. So you can ask questions of any of us at that time. We plan for the Q and A to last about 20 minutes. And then it will be on to the Heritage Rose Foundation annual membership meeting. Whether or not you're a member, you're welcome to join us and learn about what we're doing and get a little bit of an update about how the organization is doing. And it's doing well. Uh, we've recovered getting out of the pandemic and getting back into our activities. So at this point, I think we're ready to turn it over to Stephen. Uh, thank you, Anita. Um, I'd like to go right to my program if possible. Could we have um, a? Start by um, yeah. Okay, we're we're a little rough here, but uh, there we go. Okay, just a few images to kick off the event. Uh, maybe not. Okay, I need some assistance here. Okay, um, what's what's my we can program? Break. Okay, well here we go. Um, hmm. What I'd like to show you is um can you anybody see that? No. Yes, we can see the fourth circle. Okay. So um, let's, is that the very, yeah, okay. I'm not sure if I can control it. Okay, it's not in my, um, I'm sorry everybody, but this is um, awkward for all of us. We're just, our very first webinar and, and like Anita said, a lot of moving parts. Um, all I wanna do is see my program, um, it's not there. So the fourth circle, 
is known as the heritage. It, the collect is is predominantly heritage roses, and um, I have selected from the list of the heritage roses that are in the garden some some issues, some some stories and whatever about the you know behind the scenes of these roses. And Kim, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are I you one? I don't see my program. Okay, so go ahead and share your screen again. Share my screen. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. And okay, let me send you another request. And Kim, this is Anita. I turned off my webcam, but I've gotten a message uh, from Sue Bennett saying that she can't hear the sound. She can see people's mouths moving, but not hear the sound. Okay, uh, there it is, but it's so small, I can't really use it. Okay, so you see your, your, your presentation. Are you on the Mac, Stephen? No. Okay. Um, at the bottom left, do you see any controllers down there where you can, are you trying to move the, the presentation? I'm trying to open it up. Okay, it, it's open. We can see it. But I can't. Okay. It's a little. It's in this. It's um. A little thing in the corner. And okay. I can't control it. Down at the bottom, do you see your PowerPoint icon? No. You don't see your power at the very bottom where all your icons are. You don't see your PowerPoint. On my on my own computer, no. Okay, now I see it. Okay, there you go. Sorry, guys. I don't know what I. Oh, it's gone again. Okay. Well, did it go behind? Do you have another screen in front of it? Is something else in front of your presentation? There it is. Okay. All right. Let's get back to this. So here we are. Here's the fourth circle, and it's brand new, brand brand new plantings. But the 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 climate in Shreveport will will soon show that these plants will get quite big. Um, the entire fourth circle was designed by one of our members, one of our board members, Pam Smith, and um, Pam has done a wonderful job of going through all of the. Uh, suggestions that were sent to us by members of the foundation as to which roses they would like to see in, the, in this collection. And we ended up leaning towards roses that are more suited for the climate of Shreveport, which is, I think, zone 8A. So you won't see very many um, cold hardy um, categories such as mosses and gallicas and some of the hybrid chinas either because they don't really do well when it's so warm. But instead, there'll be a lot of china roses, tea roses, noisettes, and bourbons. And Peggy Peggy is our, our bourbon queen today. And um, I will be showing you some of the other ways we are encouraging preservation of, of the gardens. Um, okay, I can't move this at all. There we go. Yeah. There, this is Pam's design, which I wasn't using this so you could read it. It, it. Her handwriting is quite small in this image, but you can see how much work she has done, how she has put into to creating this wonderful garden. I would say within two years' time, there should be a magnificent display here. But right now, if you were to wander through the collection, you'll see a lot of roses you may never have met before. So we're hoping to to bring people down here to see a very complete collection of, of um, heritage roses that are suitable for the warmer climates. We also, the foundation has invested some money into uh, with, the, with the fourth circle. We have purchased some structures that will be built and put into the, into the fourth circle as well. And this is an example of one of the structures to hold vigorous, um, teas and chinas, as well as uh, small, well-behaved climbers. 
Okay, I want to go back the other way. Here we go. That's my opening slide, which is important. This is Peggy Martin, and this is in zone six up in Connecticut. And this plant, and this is also, this is Rev Door on the left hand side. Both of these roses, we weren't sure they would survive this cold climate. Rev Door definitely was on the edge, but Peggy seems to love cold weather as well as hot weather. And this is on my office at Elizabeth Park in West Hartford, Connecticut. And there is one person on the staff who feels this rose is inappropriate and keeps threatening to, to have it removed. But we have gathered such a strong audience for this rose that it will be there for quite a long time. And this rose was planted, it's one plant down here where my cursor is, one plant two years ago, two years before this photo was taken. That's how quickly and how strong the Peggy Martin rose is. And Peggy Martin herself is a strong person. She's, she's gotten through a lot of stuff to be here today. And she's going to share some, some of her rose loves. Um, but I do want to say that um, you never know, you know, if, if it's a public garden and a new administration comes in, they may decide to suddenly remove all these roses that seem that not have a purpose. So we're always on the lookout for, for places to put heritage roses where they will be safely curated and maintained for a long time. So now I think I want to move, I will, I don't think, I'm going to move on uh, to introduce you to Connie Hilker, who is also on the board of the Heritage Rose Foundation. And Connie has recently published a book called Heritage Roses, a collection of essays and lessons. So I'm gonna pass the torch over to Connie and I'll, you'll hear from me after Connie is finished. Thank you. Thanks, Stephen. Let's see if I can do this. I have to, I have to disappear. Can you see my first slide? We can. And Stephen, yeah. you can click the um, camera. There you go. Pardon me? Uh, Stephen was trying to uh, take his webcam off, so I was giving him instructions. Am I done? Am I gone? Are. <laughs> Okay, I and we want my camera on. Yes, if you would like to during your presentation, you don't have to have it on if you if you don't want to. That's fine. It could be entertaining. Hi, everybody. Um, they asked me to uh, to do some descriptions of because I'll start over. Old garden roses and heritage roses are my are my first love, and it's always been that way ever since I started growing roses in the, about over 20 years ago. And most of the audiences that I talk to grow modern roses. So here we are, American Rose Society is getting into heritage roses, and we are thrilled. But some people still ask, what do heritage roses have to do with the roses that we grow today? The answer is everything. The roses from the past are the source of many of the characteristics of the roses that we grow and love today. So here is a quick overview of the classes of roses in the fourth circle of the Great Garden Restoration. And I'll introduce you to some of the roses in each class in approximate chronological order. So we're going to take a little trip through time. Gallicas, oldest class of hybrid roses. Their smaller plants tend to be under three feet tall that often sucker, sometimes sucker very vigorously. Bloom only in the spring, very fragrant as a rule. They have highly developed variety of colors like deep pink and violet and purple and mauve and many with crimson shadings. These are colors that modern hybridizers desperately tried to bring into modern roses and finally were able to succeed. The Gallicas got it the first time. We have apothecary rose, one of the oldest documented cultivated roses. It was documented till the 12th century. Very fragrant, but you have to bend over to, um, to smell it because it's fairly short. This one rarely gets above three feet tall and it suckers very, very vigorously. But I don't think of that as a detriment. It just means if you keep up with it, you'll have plants that you can pass along and share your love of old roses with friends. 
Cardinal de Richelieu, documented to 1847. The deep purple and the petal bases are almost white. The purple Gallic is always seem to get lumped as Cardinal de Richelieu ID, even though there are others that are subtly different in both plant form and bloom time. So if someone says that such and such is Cardinal de Richelieu, take another look at it and see if it matches this photo. And we have damasks. Damasks, they're believed to be a natural hybrid of Rosa Gallica and Rosa Phoenicia that originated in Persia. They were brought to Europe by the Crusaders. They're medium to large upright plants and the flowers are in shades of pink and white with matte foliage and very, very fragrant. We have autumn damask. This is in the, uh, this is in the Great Garden Restoration. This is one of only a small handful of roses that were known to repeat before the arrival of the China roses in the early 1790s. It is extremely ancient, thought to be a cross of Rosa Gallica with Rosa Moscata, which is another repeat flowering ancient rose. Very, very fragrant. And Lida, painted damask. It's not in the fourth circle. But it's one of my favorites, and that's why I put it in here because I got to choose. It was introduced prior to 1827, probably in England. It's a three foot shrub with dark green leaves, and it spreads politely via suckers. Very, very, very fragrant. We have Albas. Albas are thought to have emerged as a natural hybrid of the damask rose and Rosa canina. It was grown by the Romans for medicinal purposes. They're tall, upright plants in shades of pink and white with dense, matte, blue-green foliage. They blend very, very well with other greens of the rose garden. They are spring blooming and extremely winter hardy. Here we have Albus semiplana. This is known before 1629, but it's rumored to have been brought to England by the Romans, and it's believed to be the famous White Rose of York. It's six to eight feet tall, very fragrant, and Pat Tolan in Australia graciously allowed me to use her beautiful photo of this rose. Then we have Madame Plantier. It was introduced in France in 1835. It's moved around in the classes from time to time and it's settled most recently in here with the Albas. It has long canes and few if any prickles and pure white flowers. It's a beautiful accent in the garden. Xenifolias. Xenifolias are were developed by the Dutch and probably in the beginning of the 17th century. They are the cabbage roses with up to 100 petals or more. They're spring blooming, winter hardy, very, very fragrant, and they have a wide variety of shrub forms from very tall to very dwarf. Here we have Centifolia major, a classic cabbage rose. Introduced in 1597, roses of this type were often depicted in Renaissance paintings. It's a large, it's a very tall upright shrub. And then on the other end of the spectrum, we have Pompon de Bergon, also known as the Burgundian rose, dates from 1664. It's low growing, very low growing, two feet for me here in Virginia, and it suckers very modestly, so there's enough of it to share with your friends. It's not often found out there in gardens, and it's very, very worth growing. Now we have moss roses. These are descended from the centifolias, originally thought to have been a sport from those old cabbage roses. And the first reliable documentation of a moss rose was in 1697. The mosses that we know today have a very complicated pedigree. The buds are covered with soft moss-like growth. If you touch it, it's sticky and then smell your fingers and it smells like balsam, sort of like pine saw. They're once blooming and repeat blooming varieties of these and they are also very winter hardy. 
Here we have the old red moss. And rather than show an open flower of Henri Martin, he has bright, clear red flowers, decided to do a beauty shot of what moss looks like in the garden. It always attracts attention. Henri Martin was introduced in France before 1862, and he's also always, he's still very, very popular. Then we have Salet. This is in the fourth circle. It has large flowers. They're clear pink and fragrant. The blooms heavily in the spring and repeats modestly for the rest of the year. And with the introduction of the China roses from Southeast Asia into the Western world, the rose world changed. They were brought to Europe in the late 1700s. We imagine in a world where the other roses that I've shown you are the ones that are out there in pleasure gardens, all of a the sudden these roses come from Southeast Asia that bloom almost all the time. Clusters of flowers throughout the growing season. China roses, the flowers tend to darken as they age. They're very heat tolerant. So in areas that have hot, humid summers, like in my case, Virginia, or in Shreveport, they will do very, very well, as Stephen said. And the plants range from dwarf to large shrubs to climbers. Here we have the beginning of it all, Old Blush, documented as one of the original China roses brought from China. It's also known as Blush China, Common China, Parsons Pink China, Old Pink Monthly, etc. It was introduced to England in the early 1790s, but it was known in China well before then. It is important in the history of our reblooming roses. This is Archduke Charles, and here you can see a good example in the background of this photo how the flowers age as they uh, change colors as they age. We have the newly opened fresh bloom in the front. In the background, you have the crimson of the aging flower. Archduke Charles is a fully double sport of old blush. It has a higher petal count and you can see very dramatically darkens the flowers as they age. On a, on a mature bush, it's not at all unusual to have all the different range of pink to red flowers and it's a striking sight. Here we have roulette eye. It's also known as Rosa chinensis minima. It is a very dwarf sport of old blush with flowers that are a perfect miniaturization of the sport parent. If you put, without any scale or proportion, if you put photos of old blush right next to roulette eye, it's difficult to tell the difference because it's almost perfectly miniaturized. At least here in Virginia, it's been confused in commerce with a more double pink miniature china that very much resembles Ralph Moore's trinket. And I've seen that on the show table in my area, but to be honest, I've kept my mouth shut because I didn't want to open that can of worms. And then we have Louis Philippe. It was introduced in France in 1834. And you see the deep red flowers that are slightly paler rose in the center. This is a type of red that took modern hybridizers almost a century to reliably achieve. It thrives in the heat of summer and it's a very tall bush. I have seen Louis Philippe get to eight feet tall, fully self-supporting. Now we do the other Southeast Asian roses, the tea roses. These are medium to large shrubs or climbers. Repeat blooming, very heat tolerant. They do not mind heat and humidity at all as long as they have some water at their, at their disposal. Disease resistant, require minimal pruning and many of them actually resent hard pruning. And they may be winter tender and this varies very widely in, in the class. Duchesse de Brabant is introduced in 1857. Light pink, very fragrant as far as teas go. I can't smell them very well, but I have been told that this smells like raspberries. I can't prove it one way or the other. Repeat blooming as in almost constantly blooming. Duchesse de Brabant wants to be about four to five feet tall in Virginia. Madame Antoine Marie is a tea rose that modern rose lovers have gotten behind because the, the bud and the shrub are familiar. 
and it's I call it the gateway drug to old garden roses for many of the uh, the old the modern rose lovers. It was introduced in 1890, and the flowers are light pink in the center. They get darker on the edges and get darker still as the flowers age. Hot weather doesn't bother it at all. And it's a moderately sized shrub, four by four, maybe four by five feet wide, and that's about all. So it can fit it in, into even a small garden. Here we have white maman cochet. It is a white sport of an identical rose called maman cochet, which is a medium pink. This was discovered both in Australia and in the United States in 1896. It's a large shrub, wider than it is tall. It grows six feet high or more and can go eight feet wide or more. And you can see that the flower is white, blushed with pink at the on the outer petals. This particular uh, photo was taken at the, the, the this white maman cochet grows in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, Virginia, just across the street from the uh, grave of Jefferson Davis. The plant is still there. And then there's Sofrano. It's one of the older tea roses, very tall, um, taller than it is wide. It was introduced in 1839, has apricot yellow flowers, kind of semi-double once they're fully open and a little bit, a little bit disheveled, which is uh, kind of charming to me. Five feet high to eight feet high. The hardy survivor, and I have found it on numerous occasions, surviving completely unattended in cemeteries. Then we have hybrid chinas. Stephen mentioned them. The way we like to define a hybrid china is, I've already mentioned that when the Southeast Asian roses got, got to uh, the Western world, it was amazing that they bloomed all the time. So quickly the hybridizers got to work putting those together with the old European roses that they were accustomed to, to see what they could do. Hybrid chinas are those first, um, those first generations of combinations. And here are two of them that do very, very well in my area. We, I am in zone 7A, so we do get quite a bit of winter chill up here. We have the Bishop. This was actually discovered about an hour from my house in Southern Maryland by Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Keys. It's dark moth. Aging to blue purple, which is striking in the garden, extremely fragrant, not particularly thorny at all. It's a little bit bristly on very long lax canes. It's eight to 10 feet long and it blooms only in the spring. But it blooms longer than most of your spring blooming roses. So it's one of the first to start and it's one of the last to finish. And then we have Shaler's Provence. I'm gonna tell you right ahead of it. I, can't speak objectively about this one because it is one of my absolute favorites. It's a survivor that I have found in old home sites and cemeteries and roadsides eight times to date. And I'm sure there's probably more of them in my future if I just keep an eye out for a flash of pink on the, on the side of the road as I'm traveling about. It was introduced in the late 1790s, um, believed that it may have actually been the first hybrid china uh, introduced into commerce. They're medium pink flowers tend towards slightly lilac. They're darker on the reverse. Very, very fragrant. And like the bishop, it is an extremely long blooming season in the spring. It's six feet high to eight feet high. I grow it both as a self-supporting rose and as a small climber. And I'll never be without this one. Then we have the noisette. Noisettes are either large, large shrubs or arching shrubs, or they can be climbers. It's small, fragrant flowers born in clusters. The only rose class that was developed in America, so we can claim that one. And it was extremely popular in the second the first to second quarter of the 19th century, and many mystery noisettes have been found in cemeteries and old home sites. Here we have the one that started it all, Champney's Pink Cluster. It was created by John Champney's in Charleston, South Carolina, who did something that the other hybridizers weren't doing. He crossed two reblooming roses, Old Blush and the Musk Rose, in 1811, 
And that started a rose revolution. The light pink fragrant flowers with long, long buds that very greatly resemble its china parent. And then we have blush noisette, which is a seedling of Champneys pink cluster that was introduced in 1814. Notice that the flowers are a little bit fuller and the buds are fatter, so they very greatly resemble one another. And that's that's one of the surest way to tell the difference between the two. Very fragrant. Blush noisette, the fragrance in under the right circumstances will waft on the breeze and you'll smell it before you can see it in the garden. Eight to 10 feet tall can be self-supporting or can be grown onto a structure to re a beautiful result. Then we have Natchitoches noisette. We, I mentioned briefly the found noisettes. Natchitoches noisette is one of them. This is a tall fat shrub, six by six or, or more, with medium pink flowers in clusters. Notice how long those, the, uh, the peduncles are on those, on those clusters. It has a very graceful arching effect when you see it. It was originally collected in the city cemetery in Natchitoches, Louisiana, by Bill Welch in 1983. And then we have Mrs. Key's Pink. This is also known as Faded Pink Monthly. It's a found rose discovered again by Mrs. Keys in Southern Maryland. It's light pink, fragrant, repeat blooming, three to four feet high, very compact little plant, almost continuously blooming and extremely fragrant. And then we have Crepuscule. This is when the hybridizers had refined the noisettes a little bit more and put some tea in there. Crepuscule is a climber introduced in 1904. It's a noisette heavy dose of tea characteristic. It's golden apricot flowers. It thrives in hot weather. That's, that photo was taken on the fence in my garden. Repeat blooming, eight to 10 to 12 feet or more. And we have Portland. It's a small class. There's only about 20, ro 20 roses in this class, and it's also and formerly known as damask perpetuals. It's believed to have been developed by crossing autumn damask with other roses in other classes. These are smaller shrubs, compact, they're repeat blooming, and very, very fragrant. Here we have Marquesa Bocella. She's in the, this, she's in the fourth circle introduced in France in 1842. And it's, a, it's officially classed with the hybrid perpetuals, but Marquesa Bocella, I stick her with the Portlands because her characteristics have more in common with the Portlands than they do the hybrid perpetuals, just in my own opinion, both leaf structure and flower form and shrub form. Very, very fragrant, often seen on show tables, especially in the fragrance classes, extremely floriferous, and as an aside, this one roots really, really easily from cuttings, and I have often used it when I do propagation workshops here in the garden. And then we have Rose de Rest. It was collected, said to have been collected in Persia by Nancy Lindsay on her plant hunt, a mysterious plant hunting trip in 1945. The rose is certainly older than this. It's a dense, compact shrub, shrub with dark green matte leaves, fragrant fuchsia red flowers that age to magenta. And like so, so many of the other roses in this class, as soon as the flowers age, the, the petals just fall. So it's self-cleaning and we don't need to deadhead this one. We have bourbons. Peggy's gonna be talking more about bourbons, but I'm gonna just quickly touch on two. We have Souvenir de la Malmaison from 1843, fragrant, repeat blooming, a more compact shrub in my garden, though I know of one example where it's over five feet tall, extremely fragrant, most people's favorite bourbon. And then we have Madame Isaac Perrier. It's from 1876, and this is one of the long cane bourbons that Peggy is gonna tell us more about in a, uh, in a little while. The hybrid perpetuals. In the second half of the 19th century, the hybrid perpetuals ruled the world. They were the most popular class of rose at that time. They're tall, upright plants or small climbers. Many are susceptible to fungal diseases, however. 
and they are repeat flowering, and most of them are very, very fragrant. Here we have General Jacques Minot. He was introduced in 1853, deep red, very fragrant. It blooms heavily in the spring and moderately afterwards. And then we have Ren de Violette. This, was, this is from 1860, it has deep violet flowers, reminiscent color-wise from some of the Gallicas, on the, but it's on long canes and mostly without any prickles. So you can, you can work with Ren de Violette without fear of injury. It's very early blooming. It's often one of the first roses to bloom in my garden and it's extremely fragrant. And polyanthas, we have just left the world of old garden roses and we've moved into what are technically modern roses, but it's, these are still heritage roses because they are still, they're still the ancestors of the roses that are being developed today. But these emerged in the late 19th century as dwarf seedlings from hybridizing ramblers. In fact, initially they were called baby ramblers. They're small to medium shrubs with flowers that are born in clusters. They are repeat flowering, very hardy, very tough, and many are fragrant. Here we have white pet. It's a polyantha introduced in 1879. They're pink buds that open to pure white flowers, compact, mounding, repeat blooming, two to three feet tall, believed to be a, a dwarf ever blooming sport of a rambler. Marie Pavier, introduced in 1888, pink buds. The flowers are almost open, almost white, very fragrant, very powdery fragrance, four to five feet high, very disease resistant foliage. And then we have one that I will never be without. This is Pearl Door. It was introduced in 1875. This one, rather than being a multiflora polyanth, there's a good bit of tea in this one light peachy pink flowers with darker reverse in that little button center. It flowers in clusters, very fragrant. Books say that this is four to five feet high, but mine is seven feet tall. It's extremely happy, but I think it's that way because it knows that I love it. So hopefully this wasn't too madcap for everyone and you got a good taste of some of the heritage roses that are, are being planted into the fourth circle and I'm very excited to see what these are going to do in Shreveport. So my instructions are now that I need to turn this back to Stephen. Stephen are you there? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay here we go. Back to my my own private little circus. <laughs> Okay, can we see the image? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Kim, for being close by. And I do want to acknowledge um, several people who helped make this project, the um, Fourth Circle, a, a real thing. Uh, number one is Pam Smith, who who worked really hard to to get that garden moving forward. Marilyn Wellen um her dream to have a massive garden like this is coming to into a reality and we thank her for the opportunity to work with the american rose society and diane summers we're looking forward to working with you as well and um connie thank you so much for your program um always a pleasure to hear about all the roses that that we can grow and um the heritage roses that is and i i agree my one of my favorites is um, Scheller's Provence as well. So um, some of the guidelines in the fourth circle, um, it's it's a garden that is supposed to represent the, the best heritage roses for the Shreveport zone, which is Northern Louisiana, Southern Arkansas, maybe uh, Eastern Texas. So it's a great place to come and study heritage roses of that ilk and to see how they do. Um, you know, for me, some of these heritage roses that grow to be eight to 10 feet tall down south are lucky if they make eight inches, um, but we do try to grow them. And um, we sort of set a, a date time zone, a date line that the roses should be of pre-1900 heritage. 
but who knows, maybe some of our favorites who are that are early 19th century or 1900s will become part of the collection as well. The garden is meant to grow as we get more interested and more involved in finding um, unusual and also well-known heritage roses. Some of the ones we have there today may be getting too big and they have to be moved out. So it's, we'll make adjustments as we go along. And we hope to invite our members and, and ARS members to come down to Shreveport and help us move some of these plants around and, and definitely to come for some pruning. It's always fun to gather for a pruning workshop. So I counted on our list um, from, our, from the, AR, uh, the HRF website um, that we have 60 different cultivars, 60 different varieties of heritage roses in the garden at this moment. And that's pretty impressive. So what I want to do from this point on is talk about some preservation efforts that have gone on um, in other parts of the country, some successfully, some not so successfully. And hopefully you're looking at the Grange, the home of Alexander Hamilton, am I correct? Um, and this is one of the ones that was successful for a while and suddenly um, became unsuccessful. And that's because of the musical Hamilton. And when the set director thought, who, who he thinks he's a gardener, came up to Hamilton's home in Harlem and told the National Park Service that the garden that I designed with college students from Florida Southern College wasn't quite right. And he could do a better job and he tried, but it didn't work. We, he had found as his inspiration, a diagram, a sketch that Alexander Hamilton made before he died. And the sketch was for a rose garden in front of his house. And back then in, in 1803 or 1802, the house was in a different location. This house has been moved three times in its lifetime. And this perhaps is the best and, and final resting place for the house. It's in a park in Harlem in New York City. And Hamilton wanted to have a 18 foot diameter circle in front of his house in which he would have three tulips, three lilies, three narcissus, and three of something else. And, that, and that's what, 12 plants for a big circle. And then he, suggested edging the circle with native roses. So we tried to educate the set director <laughs> on how to plant roses and how to plant the garden and how to plan for what's going to happen down the road. It didn't quite work. So I, I don't have any pictures of, of the set director's dream design. And but I'm showing you instead what is the result of Florida Southern College students coming up to Harlem and planting roses such as Blush Noisette, Champneys Pink Cluster, Old Blush, and several different of the found musk roses. And I, my source of information for what roses Hamilton might have grown came from his closest friend in the gardening and medical world, Dr. Hasek. And Dr. Hasek had created a botanic garden in what is now under what is now Rockefeller Center. But Hamilton would stop daily at Hasek's garden and collect cuttings and seeds. And in 1811 or 1806, the first publication of Hasek's garden list, there were over 25 different kinds of roses, including the blush noisette the Champneys Pink Cluster, Old Blush, and a little red china called Chinensis Semper Florens. Oh boy, here we go again. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, Kim, if you're there, my presentation isn't moving. Okay, um, you can see it, correct? I'll do it by hand, I can do it with my fingers. Yeah. It's moving now. Yeah, these are the students from Florida Southern, and they had just they had just come to see their the first spring of the garden they planted um, in front of Hamilton's home. 
but I also enlisted some of the best gardeners of Harlem. And this little girl and her brother in the blue hat were very good at planting the same hyacinth bulb over and over again. They would plant it, they would dig it up, then they'd plant it again. I guess they wanted to see if it changed once it was in the ground, but they did have a lot of fun. And I, I, I enjoy immensely working with these gardeners more than anyone else that I've worked with. They are truly interesting um, kids and, and truly inspired by the fact that they're allowed to get dirty. The single musk, which is um, one of the foundlings, and I forget which one this might be. This may be Taylor Gate musk, if I'm not, I could be incorrect on that. But there are several that were found predominantly in Southern cemeteries. And the hunt for the musk rose came to an exciting conclusion when they found one growing in, Har in Hollywood Cemetery, which is known as the Crenshaw musk rose, a double flowered musk. And if you read the older, oldest literature out there, go into, go into some of the old medical books from the 16th century, and you'll see that musk roses are included as medicinal plants. The world of roses made a big, big change in 1794 when Slater's, or 1790, when Slater's Crimson China came to England. It was a red Chinese rose, ever blooming, true red, and it had never been seen in the Western world until it arrived with the East India Tea Company, sponsored by Mr. Slater. And he took this rose and tried to grow it but it didn't do well in the musty or the dank climate of England. Instead, it found its way down towards Paris, perhaps into Malmaison's collection, where the gardeners um, were unofficially hybridizing and discovered that Slater's Crimson China was a good mother and a good father. Not a very big plant, not a very big rose, so when something bigger and better came along, Slater's Crimson disappeared from view, from, from the markets, from inventory lists, it was considered extinct. You can go online and you, there are today six or seven sources for Slater's Crimson China. And none of them really look like the painting on the, on the left of the screen. That's from 1794, it's the first illustration a Slater's Crimson China. And that painting came with, uh, that drawing, uh, that illustration came with detailed instructions on how to identify this rose. This is a rose on the right, a rose that I think is pretty close to being Slater's Crimson China based on the way it's growing. And this is a rose called Belfield. And Belfield was found in Bermuda on the estate of Belfield. And this is a bell field that was growing in Elizabeth Park in zone six, where I keep it in a pot and move it into the greenhouses for the winter. We can never be 100% sure that we have found Slater's Crimson China or any other old garden rose unless we can find a plant that was in existence during the time, during the era when that plant was originally sent to its new home in the Western world. That hasn't been, uh, that hasn't happened yet, but perhaps we can study some genetics on offspring, known offspring of Slater's Crimson China and see if it matches up with Belfield. In the meanwhile, Belfield's a lovely rose to grow. It's in the, it's in the fourth circle. And I would love to see some of the commercially available Slater's Crimson Chinas grown side by side with Belfield to see how they compare or how they don't compare. Yes, I do like to make trouble in the rose world. One of the successful and still with us um, hybrids of the Slater's Crimson China bloodline is Cramoisy Supérieur, also known as Agrippina. Some people call it Cramoisy Philippe and Louis Supérieur because they, they mix it up with Louis Philippe, which is very similar to this. But this is a rose that tolerates the, um, the zone of um, seven, seven, 6B7 
I'm growing it in the Botanic Garden at New York Botanical in the Peggy Rockefeller Rose Garden. And it's a, a wonderful, it's, it's small, you can see my hand, it's not a huge flower. Um, but fortunately, this, this rose still exists, even though it's not the biggest red rose in the garden. Another red rose that um, Peggy will talk more about bourbons. I'll, I'll give a little intro and, 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 and I, if, if she can jump in at any time, I welcome Peggy to, to join in the conversation. Um, that's, that would be wonderful if we could do that. But this is Maggie. And Maggie is a rose that definitely belongs in the fourth circle because it was found in, let me get this right now, Northeastern Louisiana. Is that right? Hey, yeah, I hear your background noise. I know you're there. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. A plantation in North Louisiana. And it was found in a relative, a relative of Bill Welch, in the garden that belonged to a relative of Bill Welch. His uh, name, first wife, Diane's grandmother, yes. And her name was Maggie, correct? Yes. Now here, I didn't expect it to be so vigorous. And here it is growing. Oops. There's a close-up of the bloom. I love this rose. It's tolerant of, of our zones in New York City area as well as the hottest zones of the south and it's um this is growing in an old church in harlem again planted by the kids many years ago and it it has filled this window this window scene beautifully we don't spray in this garden there's no spraying allowed and the rose is thriving as well as the weeds and the ferns but peggy um i'll, I'll give you a chance to discuss some of the um techniques you do for pegging but let's move on into a, a favorite rose of, rose of mine because it really has no prickles is zephyrin druin and this is in the heritage rose garden of elizabeth park elizabeth park is the home of the oldest public rose garden in the country it's now called the helen s command rose garden and that's because um, in 1970 the, the rose garden had been willed the, the entire park was willed to the city of Hartford from the Pond family. But in 1970s, um, they couldn't manage it. They had 13 gardeners, which I thought was a bit excess, excessive, but the 13 gardeners couldn't, were not being paid anymore. So they decided they would bulldoze the entire rose garden. A group of women from West Hartford got together and stood in front of the bulldozers basically and said, you're not gonna do this. We have, found, we have created the Friends of Elizabeth Park which is now called the Elizabeth Park Conservancy. And um, it, was, it was headed by Helen Command, one of the local neighbors. Last year, Helen Command's foundation gave us a million dollars to maintain the beloved Rose Garden. A, the Heritage Rose Garden is a new section of the Rose Collection. It's a gift from the Connecticut Valley Garden Club they spent a good penny in producing this wonderful collection of roses in five raised beds to resemble five petals of the species rose. And it's a garden that, that features cold hardy and some heat tolerant old garden roses. And my favorite in front of us is Zephyrin Druen. It's, it's nearly thornless, or my grandson would tell me I'm not talking correctly, it's prickle free. And um, Zephyrin is a beautiful, continuous flowering bourbon rose. And one of the ways that I get this rose to bloom so beautifully in this fashion, instead of, it doesn't, we, don't, we can't put a support to let it grow 10, 20 feet high. So we peg it. And let's see if I have, oops. Ooh, no, I don't want to go that. There we go. I put in Souvenir de la Malmaison. I'll go back to the pegging thing in a second. Um, this is one of the most beautiful bourbon roses, which um, uh, Connie discussed. But what I learned in my research is that the, the breeder of this rose produced it with the thought that he would raise money to uh, bring awareness to the long lost garden of Empress Josephine at Malmaison. He never was able to raise the money 
but he did produce a beautiful rose, which he kept in a cage and under lock and key in Lyon, fearing that one of his rivals would steal it and name it something else. Peggy, do you have anything to add about climbing, uh, about Souvenir de la Malmaison? Only that it's just a fabulous rose, uh, just gorgeous, both the shrub and the climber, uh, and just magnificent fragrance. So easy, so healthy. Never, ever need spraying. They're just how wonderful you, how roses. Do how do you grow it? I've grown it both ways, shrub and the climber, especially uh, in my lost garden uh, uh, that I lost in Hurricane Katrina. I had a lot of uh, bourbons and roses there, and uh, I had both both growing. Beautiful, performed great. Now, I have to tell you, I've never seen someone go after those big, black, red-headed grasshoppers like Peggy. She <laughs> the and, and wasn't happy until it was crunching under her feet. <laughs> the timid Yankee was terrified by this <laughs> action, but uh, I'll never forget it, Peggy. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this is climbing a souvenir de la Maison, Malmaison, which I believe was simply a sport, a climbing sport of the shrub plant. And the ladies in the garden club really want it in their garden. And I prune it, I train it, I protect it in the winter, and I get two blooms by around now, October, November, after all that work, but they still want me to keep it in their garden. And that's okay, it's a beauty. So this is these are two of my weapons that I use for pegging. And by pegging, I mean, I, I take the long branches of the, of the bourbons and I attach them to the ground. And on the right is a um, wire frame that's supposed to hold labels, but the labels are really kind of ridiculous. But the wire frame is perfect for pegging. And on the left are, is, is an eight inch, um, steel bar that is bent to hold to to act as an anchor for for bringing branches into the ground and by spreading them out pegging them you create a, a blooming carpet but you also create an, a situation where you might get some new babies because when the plant hits the ground and it's pegged into the ground they tend to root peggy do you have experience with pegging absolutely yes uh, it's it's a technique that I use many times, especially with all the bourbons that I had. Uh, the, I like had spreading them out, sort of a spider effect, uh, and not only pegging to the ground with the um, with the metal uh, holders, but I also, if you have like day lilies, which I had a lot of plants, I had English garden south garden. Uh, you can use a short bamboo stake. And it's not seen, but it looks like the branches is floating just over the uh, daylilies. If you have irises, Louisiana irises, you can use a little bit longer um, stake. And the same thing, it gives the same effect of it. But you want it spread out all along in a spider effect. And what that does is we all know the more you arch the canes, the more the blooms spread all along the canes. And bourbons especially have very short laterals. So it's just gorgeous with these roses all along these arching canes in this effect. And it's just so easy to grow this way. My favorite roses are the bourbons because of the fragrance and also the uh, colors. Now, I, I believe that Pam has already designed it so that there are bourbons that will spill over the walls of the fourth circle. And we will be pegging so um, we can have a pegging workshop in the winter or along with our pruning workshop. Um, I want you all to set your calendars for, for maybe early February for a visit to Shreveport to do some pegging and pruning and primping. And, oh, well, anyway. So anyway, so um, that's my favorite way of doing it. And um, Peggy, do you have any maybe three different varieties you'd like to just mention as recommendations? Uh, my favorites are um, Madame Isak Pereira. Like because of that blue-purple color, the magenta, and just so fragrant and so heavily petaled. I had one in the old garden, the lost garden, that was almost a pound 
it almost weighed a pound because it had so many uh, petals on it. And then uh, Madame de Sauvigné is beautiful. It's more to the fuchsia color. She behaves just exactly like uh, Madame Isaac Ferrer. And that, that's, those are my favorites. And I wanted to mention also that you don't prune these roses. You never cut them back. You let them grow and only cut out whatever is dead because they're unique in that they bloom on old and new wood. So this is how you get more roses from your plant. You do not prune them back. You let them just arch over, fill in, spread out as you peg them. And just as I said, just remove whatever is dead or, or brown. Leave it alone. Do not prune them. Well, I think that we need to also put a, a hat, you know, a warning label on these roses. You, you may lose a child or a dog under the plant. And, and, and in that case, <laughs> I recommend some pruning, at least to get, you know, get them out of there. Um, my first job at Elizabeth Park was to teach the gardeners how to not prune. They kept pruning their bourbons and other um, old garden roses like hybrid teas down real low to the ground and they got nothing but green foliage. So now we have it um, well under control. And I also have to say that my um, heritage rose garden is a no spray garden. So we do get some black spot, but these plants recover from it rather quickly. Thanks, Peggy. I'm gonna move on. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome. My favorite rose in the whole world is it's so unusual, the green rose. And it's an American hybrid. It happened in Charleston, Car North Carolina, nope, Charleston, South Carolina in 1830. They found a green sport. The flower had reverted back to sepals, petals to sepals. And it even has a fragrance, a fragrance of black pepper. But this happened on a bush of old blush. Old blush has sported many times in its, in its long life. It continues to do that as well. Napoleon is one of them, and uh, the beauty of Rosemar is another one, but the green rose is the most unusual. And the, and the gardeners in South Carolina were so proud of their unusual rose, they sent it off to Paris, which, which, is, which was the clearinghouse. If you got the, a seal of approval from Paris, your rose was gonna live for a long time. Well, the Parisians saw, took one look at this green thing and called it an American monstrosity and threw it off the table. That was the end of its life in Europe. The, the, the gardeners came back to, to the States with their tails between their legs and they were very, very sad. But a Quaker gardener, a Quaker nurseryman who was down in Charleston but had a place in Baltimore saw the rose and brought it back to Baltimore where he mass propagated it. It only propagates from cuttings. And he sold it to a lot of Quaker gardeners in, um, in Baltimore. And I thought I would find interesting tidbits about it in this book, The Green Rose of Furley. And I didn't. It's basically a Quaker bodice ripper and it's about a man who has two daughters. One is very pretty and one is not very pretty. And he once said, he says to his not so pretty daughter, he says, Susan, you're not very pretty, but you're like my green rose, very, un very different. And that poor kid had to live with that for the rest of her life, but she still got the hot general. Um, she won that game. And um, so I, I investigated Mrs. Barney and discover that her middle name, Course, was her family name, and they owned a nursery in Baltimore way back to the early 1800s, and they were responsible for, for producing the green rose. And a family legend within the, the Course and the Barneys is that the green rose was planted and, and used as a signal for a, this was a safe house for the Underground Railroad. I have no proof of that other than the family legend. And here's an image of Furley Hall where the family had their nursery. And before it burned down, it had become a sweatshop. And um, it fallen into bad times, but 
before it was completely removed from existence, a landscape architect came to the site. The building was going to be torn down. It was in the way of the expansion of Balt North Baltimore. And he, this landscape architect sketched Furley Hall as it was before the bulldozers came. And if you go into the center, um, let's see if I can do this. No, my, my mouse won't work. Right in the center there where the green cursor is, you can see he caught the green roses. They were on the path to the front door. And I gave this program, I, I mentioned this, this event at the Northeast uh, New England Rose Garden Society uh, lecture. I gave a lecture for their convention last week. And somebody in the audience raised his hand and said, I live in Barnstable, Massachusetts, which is on Cape Cod, which was part of the Underground Railroad. And he said, when I bought my house, I discovered growing out of the, out, out of the foundation was a green rose. So there you go. It's a survivor. And I'm, I'm going to stick to that story of the Underground Railroad as long as I, I live. I kept looking at this picture and I kept thinking, I hope no one else thinks what I'm thinking, but look at the gesture Anne is giving to something. Maybe it almost looks like an unorthodox gesture or a rather, um, what's the word, X-rated um, X rated um, gesture. But instead, she was pointing to one of many of her ramblers in her beautiful garden in, in Washington State, north of, Bal nor north of um, Seattle. And sadly, Anne has left us, but she left us with a great legacy. Hundreds of ramblers that grew in this garden have had, she sent cuttings from her gardens to Malcolm Manors at Florida Southern, to Claude Graves, and um, Chambersville Nursery was created where they, they propagated and sold more ramblers, ramblers that, that Anne had imported from Europe. Some of them were American hybrids that went to Europe and never came back, but she brought them back. And um, I counted over, I think over 250 ramblers are on their way to Shreveport as part of the great garden restoration. And um, Anne would be so proud and so glad to know because Chamber Chambersville is in the middle of a big real estate project and they're absorbing all the nursery lands and destroying all the plants and building McMansions. Many of Anne's ramblers ended up in Elizabeth Park and many of them started in Elizabeth Park in 